lock to the tight. Big nice CEOs ready to fight. Chee wee wee's in the night. Chee wee wee's your delight. Alright boys, you see the setup. It's UFC 306. Your boy is g -berged, unfortunately. Meat should be back for the next breakdown, but for now, it's UFC 306. It's UFC at the Sphere, and before I even jump into this week's breakdown, shout out to our latest subs, Alan Quarose, Jake Martin, Cover Songs and Originals, John Fielding, and then of course the homie Super Fresh, but nonetheless, again, usually this is a two-man show. It's Meat Boy MMA. I'm boy. Meat is AFK for now, but the lock shall persist. It's episode 187, so let's jump straight into it. Let's recap very quickly. Last week, it was UFC Vegas 97. Your boy went 5-0. and Meat went 3-2, and so not a bad week for the Meat Boys. And most importantly, as always, the Meat Lock cashed. It was easy light work for our boy Steve Garcia. It was a first-round finish, an absolutely hellish TKO, and it was a little bit dangerous, a little bit... Uh, precocious at first, I suppose. Kyle Nelson took his back. Uh, people were saying, oh my gosh, Steve Garcia is about to get exposed. And then boom, just like that, Steve Garcia reverses the position and ultimately just brutalizes the monster Kyle Nelson with an easy light work first round finish like we suggested. So it was a $100 profit for the meat lock. You see the lifetime record cashing out a 64% clip and a 105 and 60 record. Last week we had posted the wrong record. 105 and 60 is in fact our accurate meat lock record and you see the uh, net lifetime balance so the meat lock cashed as always two in a row we're going for a third one here and won't spend too too much recapping last week because the sphere features a lot of spherical locks and we need to jump straight into it so you see the text it's the meat lock this week our boy Ronaldo Rodriguez is taking on Ode Osborne and we like Rodriguez a lot in this one and while yes, the UFC experience is definitely in O'Day's favor, we just love the energy, we love the grit, and we love the technique that Ronaldo Rodriguez is bringing. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share this direct quote from Meat. He says, Rodriguez is going to send Osbum to BKFC. Unfortunately, Osbum thinks he's UFC material, but he's more BKFC, which will be shown on this absolute meat lock. And I couldn't agree with Meat more. We love everything that Rodriguez has shown. And He's 1-0 in the UFC, got that easy light work finish over Dennis Bondar. And while, yes, that's Dennis Bondar, who has historically been an overvalued fighter in the UFC, the way he was able to just so easily dispatch of him, we think it's going to look very similar against Osborne in this one. And Osborne is a guy who is 12-7 overall. He's 4-5 and five in the UFC. So while, yes, he does have a wealth of UFC experience, it's not like it has been great experience. And He's gotten finished in two straight contests. Uh, Jafel Filio made easy light work, and then Asu Amabayev did the exact same. And he also had that early in his career loss to uh, Zaruk Adeshev, who is truly awful. And then he arguably lost to Energy and then got smoked by Manel Kopp. And obviously Manel Kopp is a high-level fighter, but some of those other losses are pretty questionable. And you'd be hard-pressed to pinpoint a, a noteworthy win of Ode Osborne. So we think that as a main card opening fight for Rodriguez, who, if you saw him at the press conference, if you've seen him throughout the media this week, this dude is absolutely dialed. His confidence is through the roof, and uh, we simply think that he's going to be too much for Ode Osborne. So we like Rodriguez to remain undefeated in the UFC, improve his record to six, uh, 17 and 2. So we're throwing down an easy 155, should net 100, get us that third meat lock in a row, and Rodriguez should be the guy to do it. So. Let us know in the comments if you are rolling with Ronaldo Rodriguez or is Ode Osbaum better than BKFC and is going to spoil this week's meat lock. Let us know. But nonetheless, another fun one here. It's Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Chi Wee Weechi Lang, who is a plus 650 dog. And Rosas is minus 1,000, which is probably uh, a stretch, right? I mean, we like Rosas Jr. We think that he has a lot of hype. I mean, he's one of the youngest dudes in the UFC. He's the opening fight on this massive Mexican Independence Day card at the Sphere. But minus 1,000 does seem a little bit insane. But 
if you look at Meat's take, he's obviously taken Rosas Jr. And he believes that the odds really aren't that crazy because a first round submission is where he's leaning. And his rationale is essentially that he's faster, he's stronger, and he's future champ versus Chiwi Wichi Lang, who is just kind of a bump. So I'm with him in the sense that I'm picking Rosas Jr. to get this one done. But at minus 1,000, there's nothing there. And I almost think that if you're getting plus money on perhaps an over one and a half, that could be worth inspection because Chiwi Wichi Lang, while not being the best fighter in the UFC, the dude is tough. And while, yes, he has gotten finished a lot recently, I mean, he's lost two of three and him, similar to Osborne, has no notable wins. I think that he might be able to survive seven and a half minutes. So I'm going to be checking out Rosas Jr. over one and a half, again, if it's plus money and maybe even Rosas Jr. by decision because this could be a fight where Chiwi Wichi Lang is just very tough refuses to quit and perhaps this fight goes a little bit longer than some anticipate so meat likes that rosas jr jr easy light work first round submission i'm officially going to go either third round finish for rosas or maybe even a sneaky decision but nonetheless it's dominant for rosas jr and at minus 1000 probably stay away from the money line because really no value there so we'll keep it moving ignacio bahamandas versus manuel torres i mean this fight is or rather this card is just jam-packed with fights that feature hype beasts on both sides, and it's easy to argue for both these two, right? Ignacio Bahamandas is a slight plus 114 dog in this one, taking on Manuel Torres, who is minus 135, but Meat is rolling the dog in this one. He likes Ignacio Bahamandas to get this one done, and his rationale is that he believes, even though Manuel Torres is, is a very good striker, he thinks Ignacio Bahamandas will have the advantage there, and the size and reach will be crucial to that, and Overall, he's just been impressed with how much Baja Mondas has been leveling up. Because if you've seen this dude, he's one of those guys that keeps getting better and better each fight. And to me, the uh, a main reason for that and uh, what I like to chalk it up to is, who's this guy's main training partner? My boy, Bilal Muhammad. And he's been working with Bilal Muhammad in Chicago now for many, many years. And I think that the tremendous gains that Nacho has demonstrated really point back to that work that he's getting in every single day with Bilal Muhammad, with the tough guys that work out of that gym. So at plus 114, I like where Meat's head at is in this one. I think that Nacho cashes as a slight dog. And I actually think that's a submission prop for Ignacio could be interesting because most anticipate this fight being just a striker's affair. Both these guys coming out, swinging YOLOs, an absolute slobber knocker. But Bilal Muhammad obviously is one of the best wrestlers in the game and we haven't really seen M Manuel Torres get tested in that department. So for my money, I think that Baja Mondas is going to, yes, of course, strike with Manuel Torres and not shy away from those exchanges. I think he's also going to really make this an MMA contest. He's going to mix it up effectively. And I think that once he realizes how much of an advantage he has, Ignacio has on the ground in the wrestling and maybe the jujitsu uh, department, I think he's going to capitalize with perhaps a submission victory. So I like Ignacio in this one too. Find a way to get this one done. But if we're getting plus 500, 600, maybe even 700 for a nacho sub, I think it's worth uh, inspection because I think Torres is going to be out of his depth when it comes to the groundwork. And I anticipate Bilal Muhammad really encouraging Ignacio to explore that, that pathway because uh, he's going to realize that, wow, all this time that I've put in with Bilal, has got me ready for a guy like Manuel, who clearly is a dangerous striker, but hasn't really been tested otherwise. So lastly, Manuel Torres, yes, you can point to a lot of his recent wins, but look at these guys, right? Frank Camacho, Frank the Tank, all right? Nicholas Mata, okay? And Chris Duncan, who he's all right, but uh, it just doesn't match the competition that Ignacio has faced. And Ignacio's only recent loss was to Ludovic Klein, who is arguably a top 15 guy in this division. So... We both like the dog in this one. I think Bilal gets him ready. So let us know in the comments if you're rolling with Nacho Bahamandas and he takes out Manuel Torres or is Manuel going to get this one done? Let us know for sure. But another interesting one here, again, hype beast on both sides. Daniel Zellhuber is taking on Esteban Rebovix. And you see Meat's pick. He's going Zellhuber all the way. He's a minus 230 favorite. So makes sense why a lot of early action has come on Daniel. This dude is a very touted, hyped-up prospect, and a very young kid at that. But he's bull Meat is bullish on Zell Huber by finish. He simply thinks that Esteban Meaty is not ready for Zell Huber's style. And while Esteban Rebovic has been impressive lately, I mean, 
We can't neglect his most recent finish, less than a minute over T-Rex, Terrence McKinney. And that was a fight when Rebovix was essentially counted out by the odds makers, but he made it look easy, light work, early and often. And he's essentially been doing that throughout his UFC tenure, right? Like Rebovix, it seems like the UFC keeps trying to feed him to opponents they think they can get an easy, light work victory off of, but he keeps spoiling the party. So I'm going to... Ultimately, roll with Zell Huber in this one, but I think this fight is actually a little bit closer than what the odds suggest. And if Rebovix ends up spoiling another hype beast, then maybe it's going to be time to stop picking against Esteban Rebovix because this dude has been impressive. He gets counted out in a lot of contests, yet he's usually the one that ends up victorious. So maybe at plus 190, there could be some juicy dog life there. But for our money, meet like Zell Huber. I like Zell Huber as well. I think by decision, though, I, like I said, I think this fight could be pretty close, and uh, I just worry about what Zell Huber might look like if he doesn't get that early first or second round finish, because Rebovix is tough, and the dude never quits, and his only loss was to Loic Rojaboev, who is a pretty tough fighter in his own right. So, Zell Huber is the pick officially. Let us know if we're sort of off on this one. Is this just an easy light work victory for Zell Huber, and we're silly to consider Esteban as a tough test for him? Or maybe you're even on the other side and Esteban is the one getting this one done. Let us know for sure. Swapping us through though, because I know we're zipping through this one, Meat Boys. Hopefully again in two weeks, Meat is back for more locks and the uh, full Meat Boy MMA experience can be offered. But nonetheless, here's where the fights really just amplify. I mean, this is Diego Lopez. Lopes up, taking on T-City Brian Ortega. And you see the pick. I was surprised to see it as well. Meat is rolling with T-City all the way in. Meat has been, you know, he's not here to to defend himself, but he has been a little bit slow to the Diego Lopez party. Uh, he keeps picking against him. You can run back the tape to see just that. But in this one, I don't know if it's more so about Diego Lopez's perceived deficiencies or if it's more so just about the fact that this is Brian Ortega, right? This is T-City, a dude who had a 10-fight win streak at one point, a dude who was essentially next in line to become champ and he keeps getting close and close, ultimately falls short, but against anyone else who isn't a top one, top two, top three guys, Brian Ortega is usually the one getting the victory. So I think Meech just still has a lot of respect for T-City, and he thinks ultimately that he's going to win this fight by decision. He's going to shock the world, derail the hype train, and his main rationale was simply just look at the haircuts, right? Ortega's hair beats the skull at 100%, and while I can't argue with that point, I think that Meat brings up uh, a good perspective with that take. I don't think that it's going to be enough. And I actually think that even with the skullet, Diego Lopez is going to find a way to get this one done. I mean, for me, it just seems like Brian Ortega, I don't know, ever since this fight was supposed to go down a couple months ago, I didn't think he was very dialed. I didn't think he was uh, where he needs to be mentally when going against a guy like Diego Lopez. And now a couple months later in a rematch or rather a rebooking, I'm seeing the exact same thing from T-City. I just don't think that he's all there mentally. I think that physically he looks uh, worse than he has in previous fights. And even in the media this week, the question was asked, you know, what's next for you at 145? And he's already, again, saying the same thing where he's basically confirming he's going to 155 after this contest because of the log jam that exists near the top and the fact he's already fought the champs. And it just doesn't seem like... Brian Ortega is that invested in 145, so for me, I think he's going to come in a little bit distracted, and he's got his eyes set on 155. So for me, I think this is more Lopes opportunity, a easy light work victory for him. To be honest, I mean, when I was when Meat and I were discussing these fights, I even floated this out as a meat lock because I'm very bullish on Diego Lopes, and you'll notice the line has really swelled a bit these last 48, 72 hours. I mean. He was closer to minus 150, and now he's basically a 2-1 to one favorite. So a lot of late action coming in on uh, Diego Lopez, and if you're bullish on T-City, then you have to love that. But for me, I like Lopes in this one. Maybe it's a decision, but don't be surprised if Diego picks up another patented finish because this is a dude who has been getting finish after finish, right? I mean, Pat Slabatini got smoked by KO. Super Sadiq Yusef, that fight was over in a minute, and everyone was picking Sadiq in that one, and then Dan Ige, yes, was a gr uh, gritty decision, but it was pretty convincing nonetheless. And 
Dan Ige is as tough as they come, especially on, on you know, six hours notice. So shout out to 50K Ige in that one. But I like Lopes to get this one done. Meat obviously is rolling with T-City, but let us know in the comments, who are you going with? Are you going with the uh, proven veteran T-City, the dude who knocks down levels test opponents all the time? Or is Diego Lopez, even with that skullet, the next thing and probably the next champ? Let us know for sure. But a couple to go, Meat Boys. Co-meet event, Grosso versus Shevchenko. And honestly, the first thing that jumps out to me about this fight is that this is a trilogy. And I think Meat makes a great point. First of all, you see his pick, right? He's going with Shevchenko all the way. He believes Bullet is the true champ. And to his second Bullet point, everyone forgot that these two already fought. And it was technically to a draw. But it was likely a fight that you could probably declare as a robbery, right? Because I think most people thought Valentina did enough to win that fight. And... When that draw verdict was announced, it was pretty shocking because when analyzing round by round, it was just kind of a tough sell for Grosso to emerge with anything other than a unanimous loss in that fight. But nonetheless, it's a draw on paper for their second installment. Grosso keeps the belt, and in so doing, she's now in the co-meet, defending that belt against Valentina at UFC 306 with the Sphere for Mexican Independence Day. And this should be a fascinating trilogy you see the odds, plus 114 is Valentina Shevchenko, and you'll probably, regardless of the outcome of this fight, never see Valentina as a dog again, but minus 135 for the champ. This one for me is tough. I've been kind of going back and forth. Earlier in the week, I was leaning Valentina, but after seeing Grosso this week, just her confidence, her calmness, and her physique, I mean, she looks in phenomenal shape. Ugh, it's tough, and I hate picking against the bull, especially as a dog, because I feel like on Sunday, once we see the outcome and if Valentina gets this one done I'll be I'll be hitting myself over missing out on Valentina as a dog but for Meat Boy's sake I'm gonna have to go with Grosso in this one I picked her the first time I think she finds a way to right the ship right the wrong so to speak because you gotta imagine that while yes she was probably thrilled to emerge with her belt you have to imagine that she knows deep down she probably lost that last fight so I think that we're getting a absolutely focused dialed grosso in her mind it's one to one and this is her opportunity to show the world essentially that that first fight that first finish she got over valentina was not a fluke and i think she's going to find a way to capitalize on the moment again because she to me seems like someone who thrives when the lights are the brightest and for that reason i think valentina is going to be on the wrong end likely of a decision this time so i'm gonna go grosso I think the rounds are probably two, two to two going into that fifth round. And then I see Grosso either getting top position or landing a heavy shot that just alters the trajectory of round five. And I think Grosso gets a unanimous decision in this one. So meet again is going with Valentina. I got Grosso, but let us know in the comments who you're rolling with because it's a sweet fight, obviously. And one we're excited about, but one that we're probably the most excited about. It's the meet event. It's the fight that the card was built around it's Sean O'Malley at the sphere taking on Marab to Wallace Willie and you know where Meat was going right Meat has been riding Sugar Sean since the contender series he's been saying this guy is future champ well before anyone else was uh, making that proclamation so he'd be remiss to abandon him now so Meat's taking O'Malley the odds are minus 135 so similar to Shevchenko this might be the last time you ever get Marab as a plus 114 dog just Absolutely insane, but Mead thinks that O'Malley snuffs Icehead. It's likely a round one or round two KO for Sugar Sean, but he does have a little bit of slight concern if the fight reaches round three or later, because we know Marab is one of those CEO of EPO type guys where he can somehow shoot 50 takedowns in a round and not even be breathing heavily in the corner. He can fight for 25 minutes. Gotta imagine he could probably fight for 50 minutes if he needed to, but the dude is just kind of built different when it comes to the cardio and gas tank. And we haven't really seen Sean in those later moments, especially against a guy like Marab, who pushes just an insane pace. I mean, you might point back to the Aljo fight, but that was a fight where, you know, Aljo, I think maybe his ego got involved a little bit and he was determined on showing the world that he could strike with Sugar Sean. I mean, he only shot two takedowns in the entire fight, once in the first, once in the second. And Perhaps, you know, you have to give Sean some credit in the uh, takedown defense department. But for me, we're not going to see a situation where Marab shoots one takedown per round. I mean, 
This is a guy who spams takedowns. If he's unsuccessful on the first 10, then you know an 11th is right around the corner. So I don't think that this fight features as much stand-up as the Aljo vs. Sugar Sean fight did because, one, I think Marab is a little bit smarter. I don't think that he's going to play into Sean's game plan. And two, I just think he's going to be way more relentless with those takedowns and not be discouraged if Sean's defensive grappling holds up initially because we haven't really seen Sean get tested in the grappling too, too much throughout his UFC tenure. And word on the street, I mean, the source is Henry Cejudo, Triple C, who one could be bitter about this Sean now having all this hype and basically being the new face of Arizona MMA. And two, it could be him just sort of needling, angling for a fight with Sean if Marab gets this one done. But Triple C is saying that the AZ MMA scene is tight knit and he knows multiple training partners of Sugar Sean who have expressed Sean is unable to get out from the bottom when a fighter has top position on him. So take it for what it's worth, right? The source is questionable. It's triple C and there could be some ulterior motives and maybe even just an outright fake news coming from trip C. But if there is some truth to that, if Sean struggles with getting out from underneath guys, then I struggle to see how he's going to be able to get away and get out from underneath of Marat because this is a dude, when he gets you down, he's got that suffocating top pressure and he's simply levels above most guys when it comes to the wrestling in this bantamweight uh, division. So me to even touch on it, right? Like he's bullish on Sean to get it done, but that last bullet point, a late TKO for Marab might be worth fake inspection because we never know what this fight's going to look like, especially as it goes later on into the contest. So I've been going back and forth similar to Grasso versus Shevchenko. Ultimately though, I'm going to take Marab in this one and similar to Shev, if you'd asked me a week ago, I probably would have been in on Sugar Sean, but I don't know, something about Marab's uh, aura, something about his confidence this week just suggest this guy knows what he's doing he has a strategic game plan and i just don't see sean going out there and snuffing him as easily as he did Aljo. however don't think that i don't think sean has a great chance in this one i mean he's a favorite for a reason i think that uh most in this youtube sphere are picking sean o'malley but at this vegas sphere your boy is taking marab to wallace willie and Marab has historically been a decision machine, no pun intended, but maybe two meets fake point, a late finish for Marab could be in the works. So I think it's worth inspection. R3, R4, and R5 finish for Marab to Wallace Willie. And officially, I'm going to say Marab gets a finish in this one. I know it might be a bullish take, but quote me on it on Sunday. We'll see if there's anything to clip and rip for a YouTube short, or if this fight breakdown will just get buried in the YouTube dumpster heap that exists so let us know in the comments are you rolling with sugar sean does he defend his belt is he the biggest star in the ufc or are people sleeping on marab and as a plus 114 dog this is the opportunity to capitalize on the machine so let us know boys again it's kind of a quick ripper tonight i mean i guess we made it 30 minutes but nonetheless let us know if you agree with any of the takes do you disagree with any of the takes or did anything stand out to you uh do you think we're casuals Comment down below, talk some smack, give us your insights. We always appreciate it over here at Meepo MMA. And UFC is off next weekend, but hopefully in two weeks, Meat will be back. He just has some uh, issues with the grill, so to speak, and is currently in uh, the process of ordering new spatulas and uh, everything he needs to get the propane burning again. So let us know, Meat Boys. Appreciate you grilling and chilling, and uh, we'll see you at the next breakdown.